And in chapter 20, verse 15, in the book of Job, chapter 20, and in verse 15, the Bible says, He has swallowed down riches, the riches of your peace, the riches of your joy, the riches of your matrimonial testimony. And the Bible says, He shall vomit them up again. And here is the explanation after the colon. God shall cast them out of his belly. God shall cast them out of his mm. belly. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. In the name of Jesus, every riches of my family, every riches of my destiny, every riches of my matrimonial testimony that Satan has swallowed down, that witchcraft has swallowed down, that demonic powers have swallowed down, and cast out of their belly. Cast it out of your belly. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and begin to pray. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and Thank you. 
Let go the rise and his enemies be scattered. Let go the rise and his enemies be scattered. Let go the good arise. Let go your God arise. Let go. My God, I'll the land, O oh God, for thy great name's sake, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. And amen. And amen. And amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you all so much for the passion, for the faith, for the sacrifice to join us on this prayer bridge so that we can start with intercession, because we know that God does not respond to principles of seminars. Mm. That God does not fall until it sees the ark. Yes. Prayer is the ark. Prayer is the mobilization of the ark to the frontiers of your battle. And when the Philistines would usually hear that the ark has come into the, into the battlefront, they'll begin to tremble. Prayer is your connection with heaven to bring the ark of God into your situation. And like it was recorded even in the Old Testament, every dragon, every satanic stronghold, every headquarters of satanic infringement, even upon your, your destiny, because you have prayed that dagon shall fall down in the mighty name of Jesus, and Amen. it shall fall down and never be recovered again. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Can you say a big amen? Amen. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all for joining. And um, I want to just uh, my wife is around, Ehoma, uh, JB, my brother, Bart, uh, Anya Bert, Dr. Dandy. Uh, I think I saw him a moment ago. Thank you for joining us so early, and Nicoline as well uh, from mm -hmm. South Africa. Thank you for joining so early. I started a series last week, which is a series for this first quarter of the year, talking about the manifestations of the sons of God in love and in marriage, in love, in the place of love, in the arena of love and marriage. You see, a lot of times we are, we are more focused on, mani on the manifestations of the sons of God in church and in the front line of ministries. 
And then at other times, we are very, very, very focused and we lay emphasis on the manifestations of the sons of God in the marketplace, in the business arena, in the arena of entertainment, and all such and, and so on and so forth. But guess what? We don't, we don't place enough emphasis on the manifestations of the sons of God at home, in their love life and in their marriages. And I want us to begin to look at that so that we can erase the negative um, narrative, the negative uh, testimony that we currently are laboring with, whereby they will say, ah, look at those Christians and those who yet they call themselves Christians or look at that woman and yet she calls herself a Christian. Look at that man. He's supposed to be a Christian leader, a pastor, a, a prophet, and a, I'm a preacher. But look at their, their, their marriage testimony. We need to erase or diminish that whole negative testimony, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of our children who are coming before us. Not just for our sakes, but for the sakes of the next generation. Please hear me. Please hear me. Write this down. I'm telling you by the spirit of God, the power of admiration is what determines imitations. The strong power of admiration is what determines imitations. And as long as the people that our children admire, they are non-Christians their imitation will be after the culture of those non-Christians. Until we live a life that is so admirable by our children and the next generation, their imitation of us and the imitation of our ways, their imitation of our biblical culture will be near impossible. Write it down. Why? Because the power of admiration is what determines imitation. Now, when you see a, an able man, uh, I'm just giving this as a, an allegory because of the Nigerians uh, on the platform. When you see an able man who was raised in Igbo land, speaking with a strong Igbo accent, then gets born again, gets committed to the deeper life Bible ministries, and then begins to take in the ministry of the general superintendent, you know, uh, Dr. Kumoyi, and takes it in so much that the next time he opens his mouth to speak, he is speaking with that intonation that sounds like that of Pastor Kumoyi. Let me tell you, they didn't rehearse it. They didn't rehearse it that I would start talking like this. No, but as the as the power of admiration was 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 you know uh, as they were drinking of that power of admiration, the imitation from the inside just began to build up. Remember what I'm saying: the power of admiration is what determines imitation. If our children do not admire what we are doing, they will not imitate what we are doing. If our children continue to imitate the unbeliever's lifestyle, their, their single mother lifestyle, their baby father lifestyle of getting women pregnant and not taking responsibilities for it. Uh, the, 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 the culture out there that is made popular through the movie and the media, as long as they are admiring them, they will imitate them. No matter the Bible verses, you make them to swallow. Write it down. Write it down. Right. You, it's difficult to imitate anyone you don't admire. It's difficult. So these are the days now, when the last of the last days, that Jesus Christ is coming soon, is no longer a mystery. We no longer need a, a, a new seminar on the apo, uh, apo, uh, apo, apo, uh, apocalyptic, you know, uh, 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 interpretations of, 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 of the book of Revelations. No! We are in the end of the end times. And please hear me. I am concerned for us and our present generation, but my concern now transcends us to the next generation. 
And if we cannot put our, uh, put our house in order, if we cannot put our love life in order, if we cannot uh, uh, reposition our character and manifestations in the place of love and marriage to the point that we win their admiration, hmm. we have already lost them. Their imitation will follow another stream. May the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. Today, again, I want to deal with identifications and mental orientation in Christ. And my text today uh, is taken from Colossians chapter number one, verse 25 to 27. Colossians, this is my first main opening text. We'll look at other Bible verses. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 to verse number 27. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to repeat some of the things that I said last week, and then I'll add some more flesh even to them because I believe we need to take seriously the issue of manifesting Christ in a Christian marriage. We need to take it seriously. We can no longer get wedded in the church and then not have church in our marriage. It's no longer acceptable. It's no longer acceptable. It will not do us good in any way. It will not, it will not lead to anything profiting. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 to 27. I'm reading from the King James Version, and it says, Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations. But now that mystery is being made manifest to his saints. And then there's a colon. Whatever is on the right-hand side of the colon is an explanation of, what, of what's on the left-hand side of the colon. So verse 28, verse 27 now, he said to whom God, would, would make known what is the riches of this glory? What is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles? And what is this uh, glory that God is talking about? He said, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is a mystery that God wants to reveal in these end times, that Christ in you is the hope of glory. My three main areas of focus again today will be number one, your identification, number two, your orientation and mindset, and then number three, uh, last week I dealt with the maladies of, of, of unforgiveness. Today, number three, I'll be focusing on the power in your mouth to create relationships, the power in your mouth to create relationships. So write this if you are a stenographer. Number one, I said, Every relationship has the capacity to succeed 100%. So today I'm going to rephrase it to capture the exactitude of what this truth is. It is every relationship of a child of God carries in it the potential to succeed 100%. Every child of God that has this Christ in us, the hope of glory, has also 100% capability to succeed in love and in marriage. Everyone without exception. Why? Because of the Christ in us, the hope of glory. This is what the Father wants to make manifested, the riches of this mystery. It is a mystery. The riches of this mystery is what God wants to reveal in your home, in your love life, in your marriage. That Christ in us, this is the virtue that we carry in ethnic vessels. This is the inestimable virtue and treasure that we carry in earthen vessel. And this treasure of Christ in us, which is the glory of God be revealed, comes with the capacity to succeed in your love life 100%. How did I know that? John chapter one, verse 10 to 13. John chapter one, 
verse 10 to 13. The Bible speaking concerning this Christ says, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But look at verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him. Have you received him? You are the one the Bible is talking about now. If you and I have received him, but as many, as many as received him, to them, to them, he gave the power to become the sons of God, the power to replicate the victorious style with which Jesus lived on the, on the face of the earth as the son of God, the power to replicate the testimony that makes you resemble Christ, that they call you Christ-like, Christian, Christ-like, the power to manifest it. He gave it to you and me. So that John chapter 14, verse 12, is no longer theory for you. Jesus said, if you believe on me, the works that I do, you shall do also and even greater works than this, because I go on to the Father. What else is going to the Father got to do with us having to perform greater works? Because he, he went to the Father only after he had conquered Satan. So he became the conqueror. Now you are doing the greater works as the more than conqueror. He only went to sit on the right hand side of the father after that he had conquered sin, sickness, and Satan, conquered witchcraft, conquered voodoo, conquered every wizardry, conquered every curse, canceled out every handwriting of the ordinances that were contrary to you, and he nailed it to the cross. Then he went to the throne of God, seated at the right hand of God the Father as the arbitrator, as the probate, to make sure that his will that he has left behind on earth, he's probating it, he's ensuring that the terms of that will that they are kept. So in John 14, he says to you, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. In John 16, beg your pardon. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Why? Because he has given you this power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Now look at verse 13. This is where you and I need to begin to take on a new mental orientation. He said, according to this power that you have received, you are no longer somebody who is born according to the blood. Or, or not of blood, not of the will of the flesh. Not the will of the flesh, not even the will of man. But now it is being born of God. It is now the will of God. It is now the power of God. Your resemblance with your father in stubbornness dies today in the name of Jesus. Your imitation of your mother's cantercary and non-submission, it dies today in the name of Jesus. Everything that still makes you resemble your ancestry in weaknesses, in weaknesses, instead of resembling Jesus Christ in strength and in glory. Today, we decimate their strength over your life in the name of Jesus. Why? Because you have believed on him. Because you have received him. He has given you and me the power to become the sons of God. The power to manifest the sonship. He has given us the treasure in active vessels that when we manifest it, let me tell you, it ought to be that to fall in love with a born again Christian is the greatest advantage that life can accord you. It ought to be that if you are married, a born again Christian married to another born again Christian, woo, you have it made. Your case is different. When others are saying there's a casting down with you, you're saying there is a lifting up. Yeah, we may all be like uh, uh, the world in Egypt, but you, your marriage will be as a, the situation in Goshen. What is happening with everybody doesn't get to you. Why? Because of Christ in you and me, the hope of glory. Number two. Remember what I said last week, and I want to add more flesh to it today. It is offenses that come that begin to reduce this percentage to succeed in marriage. 
offenses. Offenses. That's what Satan sends into the relationship to quench the flames, to quench the flames, to reduce the potency of God's power that has been deposited in you. It's offenses that Satan uses to reduce the percentage of your capacity to succeed in love and in marriage. Please hear me. You know, many, many years ago, uh, maybe about 25 or 30 years ago, when we newly got born again and came into Christianity, this is the fact. It used to happen that if you joined any association, whether it's Market Women Association or even student union uh, uh, organizations, guess what? The office of the treasurer was always given to the born again Christian in their midst. They may not give them president, they may not give them a general secretary, but the office of the treasurer and the financial secretary, even the unbelievers will be the ones looking for the Christian among them and say, I nominate that one. Why? Because they knew the Christian to carry the treasure of integrity. It's in the same way I'm saying, when people are looking for who to love, when people are looking for who to marry, it ought to be that they should send out their fishermen. They should send out their ambassadors. Say, please help me look for a born again Christian. But if the situation with us is that people are saying, eh, they call themselves Christian, but they are no different from us. They fight like we fight. They cheat like we cheat. They abuse like we abuse. They even murder themselves, you know, like other people. What's the difference? Last year, uh, there was a story that went viral, you know, on the social media about a, a Christian minister who had threatened his wife in the presence of his wife's brother, the brother-in-law, that I will kill you. The brother thought he, he was able to bring some peace into the home and left the sister in that place. And you know, a few days later, true to his threat, he emptied the barrels of his pistol, shot his wife several times to death. Now, which part of Christianity does that represent? No, offenses came and quenched the inbuilt capacity to succeed in love offenses came and resurrected the anger of his ancestry. And so he did that, which rather made him to resemble his physical parents instead of manifesting the treasures of our divine parents, of our father in heaven. Child of God, be mindful of offenses. They come to reduce your percentage, you know, to succeed in marriage. Therefore, please write this down if you're writing. Cultivate a deliberate amnesia. Cultivate a deliberate amnesia, not to keep record of wrongs. Cultivate a deliberate amnesia, not to keep a record of wrongs. You know, my wife is a great preacher of the word. She is a great lawyer. She's an articulate, well-endowed human being on every side. But one of her secret virtues that people may not know on the street is this. She has this capacity for amnesia. As far as offenses are concerned, if something happens today and I begin to tell her, oh, I don't like this. Um, yesterday, uh, the day before, I, I had noticed that they so so and so, and she's like, are you serious? I said, yeah, he said, I can't remember. You know, for the early part of the 22 years, I used to think that when she says, I can't remember, she's trying to corner me. But I've come to realize that no, she's not, she's not kidding, she's not pretending. She doesn't remember. There's another way she puts it. She said, I delete junk. I just delete the junk. Honey, am I saying the right thing? Just raise your hand and wave it right there. I'm like, yeah, she's here. She'll just tell you, I, I delete junk. I, 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 I don't remember. So when you start joining issues that generally this one, and June, there was this one, she tells you, I, the general one you are explaining, now I'm understanding, but that June that you are doing, join that, I can't remember. Please hear me. God said, when you confess your sins to me, I will forgive and then I will remember them no more. Huh? The almighty omniscient one, who has the capacity to, for yesterday, today, and forever? You say you will not remember? Let me tell you what happened. 
it didn't, it's not a loss of memory. It's a deliberate amnesia, not to keep the record of wrongs. Deliberate, intentionally cultivating this thing in your marriage. Because you know, the offenses are coming to reduce your capacity to succeed. So your response, your response to this, to this attack of offenses is that you now develop a deliberate, intentional amnesia not to keep record of the wrongs. You know how the scripture puts it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 1 uh, to verse 4, the whole of it all the way to verse 7, because it starts by saying uh, that if you do not have love, even if you speak in the language of men and of angels, even if you give away all of your riches, even if you give your body to be burned, as long as you are not manifesting this love aspect, you amount to zero in the sight of God. Why? Because power is a possession of God. Riches are a possession of God. They said the cattle on the thousand hills, the gold and the silver, they are mine. But love is the nature of God. For God is love. So First John chapter 5 now tells you, he that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Because God is love. This is the nature of God. This is the nature of our father. This is our newly inherited nature. Add verse 6 into verse 7 of the Amplified in that first Corinthians chapter 13. says that the attribute of this love is that it keeps, it does not keep record of wrong. Or it does not vault up itself. It does not keep record of wrongs. The wrongs will come, whoops, just let it pass. Just let it pass. First Corinthians chapter six tells you that why not rather allow yourself to be defrauded? That, that's the, this nature of God that is in us. And you know, we have a great example. We must build our pattern after the sample that was presented to us from heaven. And that's Jesus Christ. He loved us enough and loved his father enough that he gave himself to be killed. He sacrificed. He didn't kill anybody. He rather gave himself to be killed. He sacrificed. He is a model of our sacrificing. He is a model. Please write this number three. Offenses destroy the first attraction. Destroy the uh, offenses destroy our first love and attraction to one another. That's why the enemy is sending in the offenses. These offenses are coming to destroy our first love and attraction to one another. And the moment this first love and attraction is destroyed, we begin to develop and build a new pattern and a new normalcy. And so in Revelation and in chapter 2, and in verse 4 to verse number 5, that scripture is something that will really cause your heart to wonder when you ponder upon it. He said, you have left your first love. And I'm like, yes, Jesus. First love is called honeymoon, Jesus. The rich do one month. The not so rich, they do one week. The struggling, they do a weekend. That's how we do it here on earth. And after that, we now step down. Jesus said, it is not acceptable that this first love was meant to endure in perpetuity. So he gave a recommendation in verse five. He said, go back, do the former works. Before the offenses came, go back, do the former works. Begin to talk nicely to yourselves again, like you used to do before the offenses came. Begin to be courteous to one another again, like you used to do before the offenses came. Begin to respect and be respectful towards one another again, like you used to before the offenses came. Begin to touch one another and be tender towards one another again, like you used to before the offenses came. Go and do the former works. Go and do the former works because the enemy wants to destroy our first love and attraction to one another. It is you and me that must embrace this biblical orientation so as to deliver us from the struggle that this satanic attack is designed to bring. So you see, uh, okay, let me bring it to you like this. Almost everyone listening to me right now has either accepted as normalcy 
or lives in a society where it has been accepted as normalcy, that the longer you are in a marriage, the lesser you are expected to be in love. So you are expected to be more in love at the beginning of the marriage. Then as you are staying longer in the marriage, it is expected that your love will begin to diminish. So they ask you questions like this. If they see you and your wife playing and you are just excited about yourself, they ask you, how long have you been married? You say three years. Ah, it's okay. Is he doing you? Wow. <laughs> Can anybody testify? You know, you've heard those statements. You know, it's still doing you. What they are saying is, we know that when you stay much longer, all of this will diminish. All of this will diminish. But I've been married 22 years. We're going into the 23rd year. But guess what? The exhilaration, the excitement, the childish and childhood affinity and playfulness is still growing. It's not perfect, but praise God, it's still growing. And Jesus says, it ought not to diminish. Don't leave your first love. Don't leave the way you used to do it. Don't abandon your first respect. Don't abandon your first uh, attractions to one another. The person is still the same person. The person is still that same person. I know things have happened between the two of you, but it is still the same person. Oh, oh okay. Oh, yeah, I, I think I need to illustrate this. I, I sincerely, I wish I had just a one dollar bill so that I can uh, give this example to the point where I will tear the dollar bill. But this is a $20 bill. If I told this one, my wife, I'll be in trouble with my wife. I know that in the name of Jesus. She's going to call me and say, honey, I saw that example. Tell me, what are you sitting on? You must be sitting on something you have not disclosed. I need to know the truth. You swear on the rapture right now. Did you just tear $20? So I'm not going to tear $20. If it was $1, I would risk it. You forgive me very easily. But for $20, you all will go home in peace and I will be in trouble. But here is my analogy. Take a long time. That you first in love with at first time. Then challenges began to come. Offenses began to come. And what they do is that they rumple that dollar bill. They squeeze it and they rumple the dollar bill to become something that is squeezed. But guess what? When you still open this dollar bill, the original value has not diminished. If I told this dollar bill, like I said, I won't do for my safety and health reasons with my wife, I won't check. But even if I tore it, if I grab a, uh, a cello tape and then I stapled it together, the scar of the, of, the, of the cello tape will not reduce the value to $19 when I take it to the marketplace. It is still the same $20 in value. The person that you fell in love with is still there. The person that you were attracted to is still there. Offenses have come. The marriage has been squeezed and rumpled and put under pressure. But I am under commandment to tell you by God today, return to your first words. The value is still there. It's still there. You say, Pastor, you don't know who I'm married to. My, my, my wife has changed completely. No, it is offenses that are changing the perception. Offenses are changing the affiliations. Offenses are changing the perception. Offenses are changing the affiliation. What do I mean? It's offenses that have been poured down in your heart that makes that person to now become so irritable to you. Something they used to say at the beginning of the relationship and you will laugh. They will say it today and you flail. It is offenses that is now cutting short of your affiliation so that when they do good to you, you no longer perceive it as good. When they, when they touch you, you don't feel anything any, anymore. Don't feel anything because offenses have come. May God give us understanding in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, I move on by saying number four, that I said the first and the most potent cure for offenses is not to change your partner by divorcing them and marrying somebody else. The first and the most potent way to cure your offenses 
It's not to set a standard and demand that your partner should change before you change towards them. The first and the most potent way to cure offenses or to disable the maladies of offenses in your relationship is for you to renew your identity and your mind or mental orientation in Christ. There is a way you live a life that is full of the Holy Spirit that you are not, you are not easily irritated. You are not easily offended. You are, you are not easily moved by the things that happen on the outside. There is a way to do that. You just renew your mind. You just renew your orientations in Christ. Just remind yourself of the Christ in you, the hope of glory, the treasure that you are carrying on the inside. How are you going to be able to do this in this dispensation? And according to this message that we are sharing, you must learn how to walk away from a relationship that's not working without damaging the person. Please, Christians, hear me particularly for those of you that are not yet married. You have to learn this, this, you have to learn this. How to walk away from a relationship that is not working without damaging the other person. You may not like that person. Somebody else will like them. That person may not be really befitting for you. They will be befitting for somebody else. That person may look like nonsense to you, that person is somebody else's prayer point. So if the relationship is not working, find that love way to walk away from the relationship without damaging their personality. It's in the same way, you must learn to walk away without being broken. Don't wait to be damaged by people before you let the relationship go. You know, in the, in a, uh, there's, a, there's a comical saying in Nigerian colloquialism. They say, monkey no fine, but in mama like cow. That's the plain truth. That's the, that's the plain truth. Don't allow yourself to be damaged by anybody. Don't allow yourself to be broken by anybody. If the relationship is not working, it doesn't mean that you will not find somebody else with whom relationships would work. Don't hold on tenaciously to it and say, no, we must sink or die even with this because you might just die. You become broken. And when you have become broken, you walk away into life, punishing everybody else that comes into your life for the, for the, for the vagrancies of the former person that left you. You walk away broken, and then you begin to vet. You begin to punish the people that come into your life to love you for all the nonsense that the person that left had, had done or occasioned in your life. Learn how to walk away without damaging them and without allowing yourself to be damaged. Number four. Oh, this is number five now. I don't know. Forgiveness, I said, in a Christ-like attitude, gives you the capacity to see the available good despite the offenses. It gives you the capacity to see that there is still good in that person despite the offenses. If you married somebody in whom there is no good, just offenses, please hold yourself accountable because you must be an idiot. I don't mean to be sarcastic, but that's just the way it is. Something attracted you to that person. It may be that you were working in the same office and you know, when they show up on Monday, Monday is your love day because of the way they dress on Monday, looking sharp. So when they show up, all your head will start spinning. That's good, check it out. On Monday, are they still looking sharp? There's still something good left there. Some of you, it was just the tone of the person's voice. There is a high pitched soprano, even in their speech, when they are talking or when they are laughing, is that voice still there? That, listen, I'm giving you very, very transient and mundane uh, analogies, but you know that person that is offending you perhaps is the one person that knows how to make you really happy, make you laugh. So when you learn to forgive, we are dealing on how to wash away offenses. When you learn to forgive in a Christ-like attitude, you will develop the capacity to be able to see the good despite the offenses. I'll give you two more keys on how to strengthen this in your life. Number one, you must learn to host what I call 
a perfect confrontation. You must learn to host a perfect confrontation. I'm not saying sweep the matters under the carpet. No, there must come a day when you're not sweeping the matters under the carpet and you set yourself to host a perfect confrontation. How is that done? The modalities of a perfect confrontation says that you must first of all start with yourself. You must first of all put the sex light on yourself. You must first of all take responsibility for your actions and omissions, your complicity and the things that you have done even to contribute to these offenses that you are about to bring to, to, to the confrontation table. You must first of all put the search light on yourself to say, how have I been Christ-like? You have to put the search light on yourself and push yourself in the spirit to that place where you are walking in love and determined to resemble Christ in all utterance so that when you come to the table of confrontation, number two, you can then speak the truth in love. Not just what you say, but how you get to say it. You can now speak the truth in love. Number three, you can now speak with salted utterance. Your, all your utterances during that confrontation will be so salted that it will minister grace to the hearer. This is how to hold a perfect confrontation. Number four, you can now address the matter at hand with particularity without generalizing. Perfect confrontation, when you are hosting it, you must now learn on how to bring out the specific particular issue without generalizing. You never, we are always, you have all, no, don't generalize. Pinpoint the issue that you want us to confront or you want us to deal with during this confrontation. No, no, number five, and the last one, you don't enter the confrontation because you want to redefine, redesign, and revalue the, the person of that person. What I mean is this, you are not trying to tell them, do you know that you're a useless person? Do you know that you are actually the problem in my life? You're the one that brought me bad luck? Do you know that you are the this, you are the that? No, that's not why you are here. That's not, that's not a perfect confrontation. That's satanic confrontation, the accuser of the brethren. And that, and for, for a lot of people, the reason they cannot um, manage confrontation in their family or in their marriage, so they run away from all confrontation. That they exit, they run, they uh, avoid confrontation in every way because they don't understand this ethos of hosting a perfect confrontation. It's difficult because it seems like, ah, no, this thing, uh, this. This, uh, pan, this discussion we're about to enter into, uh, it's going to redefine me. It's going to reshape my value. Uh, no, no, it's all of me that is now being put on the judgment seat. No, that's not how to host a perfect confrontation. You deal with the matter in particularity without generalizing. Number four, you deal with the spirit of murmuring because it opens access to the destroyer. You deal with the spirit of murmuring. Why? Because it opens access to the destroyer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse number 10, you know how that the Bible says, you know, from verse, I think it was in verse 3, that these things that happen to them, you know, he said we should be careful that they don't also happen to us. Why? Because it, what happened to them at the church in the wilderness, it was an example for us. So the Bible begins to tell you how God reacted to some of their attitudes. And the Bible says in verse number 10 that they were destroyed of the destroyers because they murmured against God and against Moses. Stop murmuring against your marriage. Stop murmuring against your spouse. Stop murmuring because it opens access to Satan to come in, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Number six, please, <laughs> you're going to love this. Now we are going into the issue of the power in our mouth to create relationships. We've already entered it. Cultivate a great watch over your mouth. Cultivate a great watch over your mouth. In Psalm 106 and in verse number 32 and 33, you see the prayer, heart-rendering lamentation of the psalmist. In Psalm 106, He's praying this prayer 
in verse number 32 and in verse number 33. Uh, uh, no, 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 this is not a prayer. Uh, this is concerning Moses. Why you must set a great watch over your mouth. Please hear this. It says in verse 32, that they angered him, Moses, also at the waters of strife or the waters of Meribah, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. And this troubled me. They angered him. They provoked him at the waters of strife or at the waters of Meribah. The people that provoked him, he didn't go ill with them. They provoked him and then he started speaking unadvisedly and it went ill for Moses for their sakes. Look at verse 33, the way he explained it. He said, because they provoked his spirit so that he, Moses, spake unadvisedly with his lips. Because he spake unadvisedly with his lips, it went ill for him. God called him to the top of the mountain and showed him the promised land and said, you will not go in. He said, go down, go down to the valley and lay your hands upon Joshua and transfer all your authority upon him because you are not going in. And I'm like, God, what about these people? You, you said they provoked him. Please hear me. Please hear me. What people do to you is their responsibility. How you react is your responsibility. It's not anybody else's. It's not. Any, everybody is entitled to an opinion. You may call me anointed, you may call me uh, stupid, you may call me powerless, you may call me whatever. whatever. It's your opinion and it's the cheapest thing. But how I react is my responsibility. Jesus says, I should not even, I should not even call you a fool, like retaliating and say, God punish you. Yes, you too, God punish you. He said, no, don't. You shall be in judgment of hell. He said, don't. And so they angered Moses, provoked him to his spirit. And then he began to speak unadvisedly. And God took it out on him. Set a great watch. Cultivate a great watch over your mouth. Please hear me, parents that are on this platform and everyone that will care to listen. Be careful what you say to your children. So, but they provoked me. Pastor, I don't know how these children can provoke. Be careful what you say to them. A couple of days ago, I was talking to my, uh, my, my uh, little daughter, you know, and, and I said to her, listen to me. What is going to make you a billionaire in life is not tied to the subject that you are struggling with. No, no, no. What is going to make you wealthy in life is tied to those courses, to those subjects where you are scoring A and A+. Plus. How did I find that out? Because God does not create anybody, does, does not, God does not create any animal and put them in a hostile environment for their habitation. The bird, he has given the skies as his habitation. The fish that he has, that he has put in the waters, the fish are equipped with gills that can extract oxygen from the waters. So God does not put the birds to live in the water. He puts the fish in the water and the birds in the air and the fish can survive in the air. They flip flop and they die, they choke. So don't look at your child when they bring home a failed report from school and then you begin to lambast. You are a failure. I always think we never do well. And for some of you, please hear me and repent today for the kingdom of God is at hand. For some of you, you actually talk harshly at that child because of offenses you are holding against your spouse. Hear me, hear me, and I beg you to repent. So that child reminds me of, of, of their father. Cultivate a great watch over your lips to bless and not to curse, to bless and not to revile, to bless and not to pull down. Number seven, <laughs> for you to be able to cultivate this watch over your lips, 
my brothers and my sisters, you have to quit talking anyhow, particularly in your love life and in your marriage. You have to quit, quit talking anyhow. Please hear what I'm about to say. It is only children that talk anyhow. It is only children and childish, and therefore childish, to say everything that comes to your mind. You see, when the little child of eight years old says to the mother, I hate you, he doesn't know what he's saying. It just felt so bad. It just felt so bad. And the only strong word he could think of to articulate how bad his feeling was to say, mommy, I hate you. The next moment when this thing is over, that child runs back into your hands and says, I'm hungry. He doesn't know what he's saying. It is children that talk anyhow. I know how 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 puts it. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. He said, when I was a child, I speak as a child. That's to say, I speak without thinking about what I was saying. I speak before I analyze the implications of what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, you have to know as a child of God, words are not just to facilitate communication. Words facilitate creation. For we understand by faith that the whole world was created by the spoken word of God. He said, let there be, and there was. So words are not just for communication, but for creation. He said in Isaiah chapter 55, you know, verse 10 and verse 11, he said, like the snow and like the rain that comes down from the heavens to the earth and does not return there, Peter, even so shall my word be, which has gone forth out of my mouth. He shall accomplish that for which I have sent it. Words carry assignments. Words. Even the one you call idle words, that's to say words idle, not without a job, I mean, without a job, without any assignment, <laughs> they are not idle. They carry judgment. Jesus was speaking along this line. I think he was speaking in Matthew and in chapter 12 and in verse number 37. He said, be careful. Every idle word that proceeds from your mouth, you'll be held accountable for it. So you have to stop talking anyhow. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 11, Paul said, when I became a man, I, I put away the childish ways. He didn't say it was taken away from me. He didn't say I went for deliverance and it was cast out of me. He said, I put it aside. In other words, it is your responsibility to grow up. Please hear me. It is your responsibility to grow up. Please grow up. Stop talking anyhow. Grow up in your marriage. Stop talking anyhow. You can't be talking to your wife anyhow. And even worse still, in the presence of your children, you can't be talking anyhow to your husband. Even worse still, among your friends. Stop talking anyhow. Grow up. Grow up. Please grow up. In number eight, I have this to say to you you have to develop the capacity to arrest your mouth. <laughs> you know, like they do in the movies, they said the police will tell you, freeze, just stop right there. You have to develop the capacity to arrest your mouth so as to save your relationship. Arrest your mouth so as to save your relationship. You know, we usually give this uh, funny allegory. I don't know if it is based on truth because I've never uh, uh, verified it independently. You know, that a woman having a problem, she went to this, you know, uh, Baba and said, please, Baba, help me. My husband and I were always fighting. By the time she gave series of series as to the things happening in her home, Baba said, I have the answer for your problem. Baba went into his closet, came back with a bottle of water and told her, once you see problems, you know, uh, brewing in your home, go and take a mouthful of this water. If you swallow it before the quarrel dies, you will die. If you spit it out before the quarrel dies down, you will die. So keep the water in your mouth. And she said, thank you, Baba. She took that bottle home and a few months later, she returned to tell Baba that, ah, my home has become peaceful. Thank you, that water worked to, it worked like miracle. And Baba said, there was no miracle power in the water. I just realized that if you kept your mouth shut, and stop talking to your husband the way you used to do, that the quarrel will die down. 
in Proverbs chapter 17, and I think it's in verse 27 or 28, the last verse there, he said, even a fool, when he keeps his mouth shut, when he holds his peace, will be counted as a wise person. Even a fool, just to keep your mouth shut, it will just it will save the day. So learn and cultivate the capacity to arrest your mouth. Psalm, Psalm 39, and in verse number one, Psalm 39, and in verse 1, they'll look at uh, Psalm 141. I need you to say this. Psalm 39, and in verse 1, the psalmist said, I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. What is a bridle? The bridle is that piece of iron that they put in the horse's mouth to hold the tongue, the tongue down, and then they, they put uh, uh, the, 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 the saddle you know, tied to it, so that when you pull that pull on that saddle on the right-hand side, it causes the metal to press against the tongue of that uh, horse on the right-hand side. If the horse doesn't bend over to the right, it will experience pain. So to avoid the pain on the tongue, once you pull that saddle to the right-hand side and the bridle presses against his tongue, he will just bend. If you pull it to the left, he will just bend. So you use that to control him. And the book of James says that it's in the same way that the, the ship, that ocean liner that you see on the high seas, despite the buffet, buffeting winds, despite the strong stormy winds on the high seas, it is able to maintain its course because everything in that whole ship responds to the captain's turning of the rudder. Where the captain turns the rudder, that's where the ship will go, not where the wind wants it to go. So that little rudder, that, that little steering that in the captain's cabin, that's what's controlling that huge vessel on the high sea. It's in the same way the Bible says, your tongue, even though it's a very small piece compared to the other parts of your body, it can set on the course of fire, the whole of your nature, the whole of your life. So the psalmist here says, while the wicked is before me, while provocation is before me, while ang uh, angering and irritating situation is before me, he said, I will keep a hold on my mouth. Psalm 141. Verse 1, then we'll skip verse 2 and go to verse 3. Psalm 141, this is the lamentation of the psalmist that I was talking about, about keeping your mouth. Psalm 141 in verse 1. He says, Lord, I cry unto thee. What's he crying about? Make haste. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. What is he crying about? Verse 3, he says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. You, O God, keep the door of my lips. Don't let garbage come out. Come and mount guard over my lips. Please hear me. Many of you that are not yet married have your mouth to hold responsible for it. People are drawn to you by your looks and your mouth chases them away. People are drawn to your spirituality. Then your mouth will chase them away. People are drawn to your accomplishment and then your mouth will drive them away. It is time to cultivate the capacity to just arrest your mouth. Tell that your mouth freeze. You are under arrest. Number nine, please hear me. Do not retaliate a bad word or an evil opinion with likewise. Do not retaliate a bad word with a bad word. First Peter chapter three and in verse number nine, he said, "Do not uh, do, do not uh, answer railing for railing." You know, so that when they say you are very stupid, say you too, you are far more stupid. Oh, you are an idiot! No, 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 no! Your whole family is uh, they are all idiots, and all of this can be happening in a Christian setting. It ought not to be. We have Christ in us, this treasure. Of in, in our earthen vessel is the hope of glory. Let me go on very quickly. <laughs> Please listen. It's amazing that Satan would want you to say some bad things in your marriage, in your love life, so that he can gain access. You remember the story of Job 
in Job chapter one and in Job chapter two. It is amazing that two times Satan confronted God and was saying to God, you have put an edge around about Satan. Remove that edge. Let me be able to touch him. For Job does not love you for naught. If you remove the edge and I, and I touch him, Job will curse you to your face. And God said, everything he has is under your power. Go. He came, wiped out his children, wiped out all his uh, properties, and Job held his peace. Satan came back again to God and said to him, every man will give everything for blah, 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 blah. But if you let me touch his body, he will curse you to your face. He kept using this word, curse, curse, curse. But Job will curse you to your face. And guess what? When his wife stepped into the scenario, into the scenery, you know, to advise him, his wife said to him, curse God and die. The same word, curse, 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 that Satan was boasting with because he wants to hurt. Oh, the same word now came out from the, the mouth of Job's wife. You think it was a coincidence? No, sir. Satan inspired those words in the mind of Job's wife so that what he said in the throne room to challenge God might now be spoken here on earth to give him access to destroy Job's life and also to give him an opportunity to say to God, shame on you, I told you. But Job said, no, I will not curse God. Shall we receive good from the hand of God and not receive evil? God does not give evil, but I need you to appreciate the integrity of Job. What he was saying is this, all that I've ever had came from God. If, the, if God has allowed this to, to come upon me, glory be to his name. I will not change under this circumstance. Let's appreciate that. I will not change under this circumstance because Satan is looking for a way to come in to kill and to steal and to destroy. Satan needed those particular words, curse, to curse God, you know, to be said, so that he can win over God and gain access, even unto gain access into Job's life. So I can gain access into Job's life. It's in the same way uh, uh, as God will use your words to gain access into your life, uh, or Satan will use your words to gain access into your life. Love will also gain access into your relationship through your words. Hate is also relying on your words to gain access into your relationship. Reconciliation is relying on your words to gain access into your relationship. So is divorce and division. Everything is waiting on your words. So you and I must now develop a new capacity. I have just a few more minutes, you know, then we'll take a, a, the questions because we have 13 more minutes to the end of our 90, 90 minutes program. Please give me your, your rapt attention as I begin to close this up. Remember what we read said, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Please hear me. Christ in us didn't say Jesus in us because there is a dichotomy that you must respect, you know, concerning Jesus and the Christ. Christ is an English word, which in the Greek used to be, is Christos. And in the Hebrew, it's the Messiah. In other words, Christ is not the last name or the son name of Jesus. Christ is the office. Christ is the anointing that anointed him to carry out the office of the Messiah. Christ is the supernatural endowment that was upon his natural conception in the womb of Mary, that he is able to carry out the redemptive plan of God on the earth. So Jesus is not the one in you, but Christ is the one in you. That same power that made him Messiah, that same power that gave him victory at the temptation of Satan in the wilderness, that same power that enabled him to cast out devils, that same power that made him to go about doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil, that same power is the Christ that is now in you to help you to replicate that same life of Jesus Christ in your love life and in your marriage. That power is in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the difference between us and religiosities. This is the real this is the real McCoy. This is the real thing. This is a true discrepancy that sets us aside and apart. Ecclesia. The Ecclesia is a called out one. The Ecclesia is a called out people. 
the set apart people. We are the body of Christ, not the body of Jesus, the body of Christ. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, but we are the component body of where that anointing is still resident. That same uh, power, supernatural, that same anointing that made him Emmanuel. Please hear me. Jesus started his existence from the immaculate conception in the womb of Mary. But the Christ has been in existence as the Lamb of God that was slain from before the foundation of the world. The Christ was Emmanuel that Isaiah saw. The Christ was the everlasting Father, the mighty God, the Counselor, the Prince of Peace. The, 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 the Christ is the Word of God by whom all things were created. Without him was not anything created that was created. He now became flesh. He took on flesh and we beheld his glory, full of truth and grace and the glorious of the only begotten Son of the Father. That is the Christ that is in you that has become the hope of the glory of God. No longer what I receive as a child of the lineage of the Asegeme, but this power that came from God that was once in Jesus to make him the Christ, that same power is now in me to make me resemble the Christ. That same power is now in you to make you resemble the Christ. Please let me round up with this. One man, one man, at one point he was Senator Obama. Then at another point he was President Obama. But right now he is Mr. Obama. The same person, guess what? If he had died as Senator Obama, the implications of his death would be totally different from the implications of his death if he had died as Mr. President. If he dies today, please let me tell you, the implications of his death are totally different from if he had died in office as President Obama, the same person. But the dispensations of the times made him different. And his death in any of those scenarios carried different implications. It's in the same way, this Christ was the word of God that was with God from the time of creation and the lamb of God slain from before the foundations of the world like Senator Obama. This same Christ took on flesh in the womb of Mary and it became Jesus, the only begotten son of the father. Just like when he ascended, when Obama ascended the office and became President Obama. And his death, and this Jesus' death, the death of this Christos, after he has become Jesus, the implications of it is eternal, too far reaching beyond what you and I can ever imagine. Today, that same Christ has now become the Son of God, seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercessions for you and for me. Please hear me. In the book of John and in chapter 14, chapter 7, verse 13, 37 to 39, the Bible says, on that last day of the feast, that great day, he lifted up his voice and he cried saying, if any man believe on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow the rivers of living water. Mark the connection. When you believe on him, as the scripture has said, not as your church or denomination has said, out of your belly shall flow the rivers of living water. And by this take he of the spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for as at that time, the spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. It is his death as president. It is his death as the prince of peace. It is his death as Jesus being the Christ that has made our lives a qualified habitation for the spirit of God. It is his death that has made us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Please hear me. Have you received that anointing, that supernatural endowment from on high? 
Have you received that Holy Spirit? This is the real differential. Listen, <laughs> I know for some of you, you are almost thriving now on being a good person. Your sense of being a Christian is tied to your sense of being a good person, that you don't lie, you don't fight, you don't steal, you don't uh, do a drink or you don't smoke. Or, or No, our best of best human behavior, our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. What God wants to see is faith in the death of Jesus, the substitute sacrifice, and you come to him and say, I believe. And Jesus says, if you truly believe and make the connection according to scripture, bam, out of your belly shall begin to flow the rivers of living water. Let me close today by saying this. Second Corinthians chapter five and in verse 14. Now you will understand that verse more properly. He said, the love of Christ constrained us. He didn't say the love of Jesus constrained us. He didn't say the love for the person of Jesus constrained us. No, he said the love of this anointing of the anointed one, this treasure that has come into our 18th vessel, this power to live the Christ love is what is constraining us. Please grow up in the knowledge of the Lord because you know this power and you want to retain this power. Don't let anything cause your mouth to begin to speak anyhow so that you can retain this power in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray. Amen and amen. I'll draw the curtain right here. My time is up, but not my words, but I'll close it right here for today so we can keep our 90 minutes designated for this program. <clears throat> I perceive that the network must be poor generally in a lot of places because a lot of the regulars are not able to show up here. And others who came, it's almost as though they were uh, zoomed out again. But guess what? <clears throat> it is your responsibility and my responsibility to evangelize our world. Don't stand by and watch people suffer in their marriages when what we learn here can help them. So reach out to your friends, your families, to our associates and to your loved ones and do your best you know, to bring them to these meetings. Praise God. Do you have any questions? We have three minutes. Any questions, please? Any questions? This is the second installment on manifestations of the sons of God in love and in marriage. Do you have any questions? If you have a question, just raise your hand so that you can unmute. <clears throat> Any question? I see a new face, Lisa Unamdi. So good to have you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, okay, I think the others are regulars. Tolu Odigye is here. Olayinka is here. Good to have you. JB Abro is here. So good to see you, Francis. E.K. Stanley of Parocha. Happy New Year to you, my dear Stanley. And of course, my number one intercessory person, Iwoma Madweke, uh, our admin who's always helping us to stay on course, Brother Ibidu. I know Tosin Babalola was around at a time and she was helping us post the scriptures, but maybe she's also been zoomed out by the, by the network. Okay, hallelujah. And uh, of course, my Agege bread is here. <laughs> uh, my dear wife, so good to have you. Yes, do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? Do you have any observations? Anybody, just raise your hand. I celebrate you, Stanley. Just raise your hand so that we can uh, have you on mute. Anybody? Okay. Any questions? I've come to learn, like they say, matters of the heart. There is a hand, Francis. Ike. Yes, Francis, Ike, please unmute yourself and ask. All right. Good evening, sir. Good evening, my brother. Um, it's actually been a while. I, I, I couldn't be online last, um, last week to um, listen to the messages, but I, I was blessed with the um, one you sent. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, there is this thing I'm struggling with. Like, you know, I was having issues with uh, having issues in my marriage. And um, so this moment, I mm. still don't know um, what God is saying about it. Like uh, I've tried and struggled to, to handle 
the situation and is um a bit um difficult now um well, the messages i'm hearing is actually um putting me on the right track is actually putting me in a, in a way that um there are some things that i did which i am realizing now that i could have um, controlled or, or managed uh, in marriage and i truly appreciate the world that is coming out from your mouth i truly appreciate god using you mightly to to settle issues in marriage now i am i am i i don't know if um the 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 word divorce in marriage uh, is actually very heavy in the mouth to see but is it actually advisable for uh, couples that have been married for like five five years six years thereabout and with those issues they having in marriage not being settled and all of that too for one to say okay i'm done with it let me just end this for the interest of peace and all of that yeah, because is it is is it god's willing for the separation to take place for the interest of peace that is the angle i'm just um, trying to hit in thank you so much francis uh the question is short but the answer is a long three hours of seminar but for the a few, uh, few moments we have together. Let me say this, and then I'm going to ask my wife to say something because she has just been handling a situation, you know, uh, uh, like that. Uh, I, I don't want to quote her, quote her wrongly, you know. But hear me. Number one, I put out a short video and then an invitation, you know, that sometime last week there about begging people to please come on this program with your spouse. It will do you a great world of advantage when the two parties hear it together. And I said, number two, the reason is this, that it is not right that one person is putting in all the labor, making all the sacrifices, adjustments, you know, and compromises in order for the relationship to work until the other party also starts making adjustments. The sacrifices of the person making all of these adjustments may be in futility. So let us attend together. Let us uh, hear these things together. Let us face, uh, let us seek help together. There is professional help everywhere in the church, among your pastors, among marriage counselors like myself and my wife and others that God has called to this. Pastor Ben Sinobe, uh, uh, a lot of them, uh, 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 Pastor Thames, you know, a lot of people that God has called to marriage counseling, reach out to them. I assure you. What you will pay for counseling will do you far more good than even recharging your network uh, with uh, a, uh, an MTN card. It will do you much more good, but let us do it together. Having said that, today I taught us that one, let us learn the art of hosting perfect confrontation. Perfect confrontation. And I gave us certain indices, certain ethos, certain practices to make the confrontation a perfect one. Number one, put the search light on yourself. Ask yourself, what have I done or not done to contribute to this situation? Number two, put the search light on yourself and push yourself in the place of prayer, fasting, studying the word of God so that you can take on the image of Christ, this anointing from heaven that is in you to make you behave better. Then I said, number three, make sure you go into this confrontation to speak the truth in love, not just blah, blah, blah. No, to speak the truth in love. And I said, number four, that all your utterances should be salted, ministering grace, even to that your partner that you are bringing these confrontations, even with. I said, lastly, that you will raise particular issues without generalizing. These are the keys to having uh, to host a perfect confrontation. We're not saying sweep matters under the carpet. When you have done all of this, you are able to come to a realistic conclusion that this relationship will work if we just work at it. And these are the things we need to do to make it work. Or this relationship will not work and it is better for us to leave it so I don't damage you, so you don't damage me. 
that I'm not good enough for you doesn't mean that I'm not good enough for anybody. And I alluded to the uh, to the comical, you know, uh, uh, comical uh, uh, colloquialism in Nigeria where we say monkey no fine, but in mama like calm, you know. So uh, let's not destroy ourselves, you know, if it is not working. But I've said that. Uh, oh, my wife has been zoomed out again by the network. I can't see her anywhere. You know, because I was going to ask her to say something. Because see, I've just handled a very, very similar situation. It's imperative for you and I to know that God hates divorce. But he didn't say that he hates the divorcee. God hates divorce, but he never said he hates the divorcee. He hates divorce because of what it will do to the heart, do to the children, do to your life. <laughs> Let me tell you. <clears throat> You remember how I said in the beginning that being a child of God who has received the divine nature, you know, of God makes you a candidate that carries the 100 capacity to succeed in a relationship. And I said, the only thing that begins to reduce that uh, inborn capacity to succeed in marriage are offenses. Offenses, they are like the ice. You know that big, uh, I mean, the story that we hear about that big ocean liner, the Titanic, we are told that when the captain looked, uh, looked through his telescope and he saw the ice iceberg that was there in the waters and he began to steer the ship to avoid that ice, what he saw pointing out from the water was a little tip of the iceberg. But what was in the belly of the sea was ice that is so sharp that it lacerated the body of the Titanic. It lacerated the whole metal, thick metallic body of the Titanic that the Titanic took in so much water and it sank. And I'm telling you and me, offenses not properly treated and forgiven. You know, yeah, my wife says, I can't connect back, honey. The network is big mess here. No problem, I'll sort it out. You know, the unforgiveness of these offenses when they come, they are like that iceberg. They are like that deposit of ice in the water. Ice, ordinary ice, water that is solidified, carrying the capacity to lacerate the thick metallic body of the Titanic. The same thing, when offenses are not properly resolved and forgiven. They have the capacity to lacerate the security of our marriages and drown it. So my brother, before you contemplate the word divorce, contemplate hosting a perfect confrontation. Before you contemplate the word divorce, contemplate your forgiveness and the capacity to deal with your offenses from the standpoint of a Christ-like attitude, amen. I'll stop there and see just for a few seconds. My wife is back. Honey, could you say something concerning uh, Francis's question? Uh, I really love it, Francis can find a way to connect. The network is really bad, can bounce. I know, uh, your, your, com your comment is the last thing we are gonna take. Okay, um, I really think it needs to, both of them, need to evaluate their Christ-likeness, mm -hmm. how much of Christ they have on their inside and how much they are willing to fight for what they believe. Offenses will forever come. And as truth of the matter is, this spirit of divorce has become a swinging door. Mm -hmm. If you don't shut that door permanently, the devil will suggest it to you every moment. Mm -hmm. But it's not only one party that can decide against it. It has to be both of us to say never again would we use that word. The issues will always arise, except the issues on ground as such that, oh, your life is endangered, you are suspecting diabolism, you are suspecting physical harm, and all of those. If it is just these daily issues of, oh, you didn't greet me well, you didn't shut the door after you, you didn't wash the plate, they will forever be there. Once we solve this one, move into another one. So marriage calls for maturing and growing up. But the minute divorce features in your communication, it becomes what the enemy will use. And the day the enemy will make use of it, you will be amazed. It will be the negligible things that you have overlooked on a good day. 
But when you give, the Bible says, give no place to the enemy. No place is no place. No place is no place. The, the network is swinging me here, and so I'm a bit destabilized. I but know. I just hope that has helped a bit. Hallelujah. So, uh, Francis, I hope this has helped. Uh, my number for those of you that may not have it is plus one for Canada, 416-409-0566. Plus one, 416-409-0566. You can reach out to me on WhatsApp. Uh, my wife is at home uh, and you can reach her on MTN 080-3320-8862. Hallelujah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, matching glasses, God see, of our dear Baba T, okay? <laughs> you are supposed to fo focus on the word of God, not on the glasses. You are a canal administrator. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you guys for coming to share fellowship with us. And um, please reach out to your friends. Uh, build prayer network amongst your friends. Daniel went to his company. They were a company of friends that they could pray together. You know, uh, uh, JB, you know, uh, how is your darling wife? Hope she's doing well. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Oh, she is here. She's here. Okay. It's good to see you too. Happy to see you. Good evening, darling. God bless you. When I saw your glasses, I, at first I thought you were in Nigeria. I thought you were in That's the tea's glasses. I know. <laughs> no, she got, she got me my own pair. You know, so okay. uh, I didn't have to carry hands. You know, praise God. You know, Stanley, where's my daughter? Where is she? Hmm? You went out to get something. Oh, okay. Please give yeah, myself sure. to her. I really appreciate those of you that attend with your spouses. It really, really helps when we hear these things together and then forge adjustments, you know, concurrently. As this person is adjusting, this one is adjusting. May the Lord give you uh, capacity for change, the grace to make a sacrifice for the other person in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Now we have to go, we have added like 10 minutes to our usual time. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us. And I thank you for all your nice uh, compliments. And I wish you all a very, very great week. God bless you. Maga get bread. All right, bye for now. God bless you all. Admin, thank you so, so much. All right, guys, have a good one. Hallelujah. Thank you.